So once again, I want to welcome everybody to our leadership webinar entitled Keeping Pace with K-12 Online and Blended Learning, a Guide to Policy and Practice 2013, the 10th edition. Wow. I didn't realize it's been 10 years since you guys started this, uh, John and Amy, and I'm happy to say I was around 10 years ago and remember that very first one. So it's exciting to have you both here today to share with us all the updates of the, the past year as far as online and blended learning. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, folks, this is John Watson with the Evergreen Education Group. And uh, Rob, we appreciate the opportunity to speak to all of you today. Uh, I have with me, uh, although remotely, uh, my colleague Amy Murren, who is the uh, lead writer and researcher for Keeping Pace. And uh, in fact, she is going to be uh, running much of the session. Uh, Amy is up in the Denver, Colorado area. I am today down in uh, uh, Tempe, Arizona, near the campus of Arizona State University. Uh, I mentioned that I have Amy with me here today, but didn't really mean it in the sense that she's only joining remotely. I do, however, have my dog Crow sitting at my feet here. And the reason I mention that is because uh, about five minutes before this uh, started, the UPS guy rang the doorbell and reminded me that when the doorbell rings, Crow takes it as his mission to scare anybody approaching the house away. If that happens again, uh, you may hear an explosion of barking. And uh, I'll probably mute myself and Amy look to you to pick up whatever I had been saying uh, at the time. Uh, the, uh, a couple of other things before we jump into this. Uh, first of all, I thank you to those who have, uh, in the chat window, told us where you're from and, and uh, a, a little bit about who you are and who you're and what type of position you have. That's very useful for us to see. Uh, glad to see really a wide variety of, uh, of people, organization types, geographic locations, uh, well represented here uh, from school districts to intermediate units uh, and other types of organizations as well. Also really enjoying the uh, geographic diversity from people all the way around the country to uh, a professor at Arizona State University, probably about three miles from where I sit right now. So welcome and uh, thanks for joining us today. I'll also mention that uh, Amy and I really like to use the chat window uh, quite a bit. One of us will always be monitoring as the other one of us is talking and presenting. Uh, and uh, so I'll ask Amy, as, I, as I'm giving my a fairly quick opening here. If anything comes up that I should address, please let me know. I'll do the same for you. And Rob, uh, I, I know that you're monitoring as well. If Amy and I miss a comment that we should address, uh, I would be glad to uh, have you jump in and ask us to clarify uh, a comment, a question, or anything like that. So folks, please feel free to jump in with any, any comments about how some of what we're talking about relates to your situation with your school or in your state or asking any questions that where you'd like further clarification. For those of you who went to the uh, iNACAL conference that just ended in Orlando, which was uh, better than ever, they keep getting better every year, uh, and it's really a credit to the organization. The uh, In the program guide, Susan Patrick in her opening letter mentioned that uh, the organization that turned into INACAL uh, started uh, about 10 years ago. And right about that same time, uh, Evergreen was being approached by the Colorado Department of Education, which said, we have a set of policy questions related to online schools and online learning, and uh, we don't know how to answer them. Will Evergreen help? And our answer was, we would love to help. Uh, we also knew that the Colorado Department of Education budget was fairly small and did not approach the uh, magnitude that was necessary to answer those policy questions. And so we uh, approached a, a small set of organizations to join that effort. Uh, they were uh, the North Central Regional Education Lab, 
the Illinois Virtual uh, High School at the time and the Wisconsin Virtual School. Those were the four founding organizations for Keeping Pace. Uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to see Matt Wicks, who is now with Connections Learning, uh, on with us today. Matt was part of that founding group back in uh, 2003, 2004, uh, and Matt has in fact been in one capacity or other with uh, part of the Keeping Pace team ever since as, as part of uh, IVS and then uh, INA call and then his own consulting and, and now connections. And we've also really just had a tremendously valuable set of sponsors throughout the years that we have been publishing the report. The report really aims to provide up-to-date policy and practice information that is useful to a wide variety of practitioners and policymakers. The report is Creative Commons licensed. You can download it uh, and all the graphics at kpk12.com. The sponsors this year, uh, I won't list them all, but you see them on, on this slide. Uh, they are, as they are every year, a mix of uh, public agencies, private nonprofit organizations, and private for-profit organizations. And we feel that that's tremendously important because it really reflects the full range of types of organizations that are involved in online learning. Everybody from individual schools and school districts and state education organizations to nonprofit organizations, state virtual schools, uh, and companies uh, that are providing courses or entire schools, they are tremendously valuable in helping us put together the report. The other piece that uh, we instituted this year to help with the report that I, I'd like to acknowledge is the Program Advisory Board. We recognized uh, last year that while we were increasingly reporting on what individual school districts are doing, that we did not have enough formal representation in the report uh, from people with individual districts. And we pulled together this group who joined us uh, every month throughout the project uh, by phone to help inform what we're doing. Uh, and I think the results uh, of their involvement are reflected in, in really a far greater understanding than the report has ever had about what, in fact, is happening at the district level. And with that brief opening, I'm now going to turn it over to Amy to talk about the landscape uh, of different types of programs, uh, some key policy issues. Uh, Amy, feel free to uh, uh, let me know if you want me to chime in anywhere. I may do so even if... Uh, <laughs> even if you don't want me to necessarily, but I certainly oh, am well, uh, I'm glad to do so. And uh, I will also be watching the <laughs> chat window. So, Amy, to you. Excellent. Thank you, John. Um, if anyone has trouble hearing me, please type up in the chat window as well. I know that I'm getting over a cold and so my voice is a little bit low these days and I want to make sure you can hear me okay. Thanks for a great introduction, John. Um, we're really excited about having 10 years of keeping pace under our belts, um, although for me it's about four years at this point. For John, it's about 10. But one of the things that we've noticed in the last couple of years is, as I'm sure all of you have noticed, and in fact I've noticed that a lot of the folks in attendance aren't necessarily from online schools or virtual schools but are from what appear to be district schools that are likely either interested in adopting online and blended learning or have already begun to adopt online and blended learning and are looking to see what else is going on around, um, around the country. And so what we're seeing is this rise in blended learning across all of the categories of programs that we've looked at over the years. So historically, we've looked at multi-district fully online schools and state-supported supplemental options like state virtual schools. Um, we just this year added private and independent schools to keeping pace. But what we're seeing is this rise in single district programs. And so just programs that are just serving students within their districts, and we'll talk about those in just a minute, as well as a rise in blended learning through all of these programs. And so blended learning is really a theme throughout the report, and in fact, I'd say more so this year than ever before. 
And we lean on the Christensen Institute's definition of blended learning, which you see up on the screen here, that combines both the in-person, um, uh, excuse me, the, <laughs> the online learning with some element of student control over time, place, path, or pace, and then some learning in a supervised brick and mortar location away from home, so likely a school, maybe also a learning center or a library. And then last but not least, looking at connecting those learning modalities with and creating an integrated learning experience. So it's not necessarily just about watching some videos online, but it's about connecting the learning experiences that are happening both in school or at that learning center and at home so that the student and teacher are working together to create a personalized learning experience. We talk a little bit more about blended learning and um, look at the Christensen Institute's report as K-12 Blended Learning Disruptive, which was released in May 2013. And if you haven't had a chance to read this paper, um, it's definitely a um, more of a theoretical paper than some of the last two, but a really interesting look at whether or not blended learning is disrupting the education system and where we think or where they think it's headed. Keeping Pace took an opportunity this year to look at blended learning in the context of what we're calling fully blended schools. So we define a fully blended school as one with a standalone school that, is, that has a school code, where much of the curriculum is delivered online, and attendance is required at a physical site for more than just those state assessments. In presenting this material at the INACAL conference, we had a couple of folks ask, what we mean by much of the curriculum. And um, we do not put a percentage associated with this definition because the bottom line is that there isn't some magic number. No matter how much legislators or policymakers would like for there to be a magic number that equates to blended learning, the reality is that 20% of the curriculum could be delivered online and still could be very much a blended class, or 90% of the curriculum could be delivered online and students would be required to show up maybe once a week or once every other week, and that could be a blended class. And so there isn't a magic definition of what we mean by much of that curriculum, but we do think that there is the focus needs to be on curriculum being delivered online. So it's not just homework, it's not just um, sharing a calendar, but that it's actually delivering that curriculum. We identified fully blended schools in 24 states that you see highlighted in blue on this map. We know a couple of things about this map. First of all, this is actually our first attempt at trying to identify states that support fully blended schools. So we're pretty darn sure that we have missed not only some schools and states where we've already identified some schools, we think there might be more out there in states that are supporting this option, but we also wouldn't be surprised if there are states out there that have blended schools that we didn't identify. If that's the case, then actually as we go throughout this presentation, we'd love to hear from you if you know of an example of something that we're missing out on or a school or a district that we should be aware of. But what we believe is that these fully blended schools, which are often charter schools because charters allow for some flexibility in how students are um, and how schools are meeting state requirements and state laws. Um, but in states that allow them, we're seeing a number of them. In my home state of Colorado, for example, we're aware of at least a half a dozen fully blended schools because there's a policy environment that supports their existence. John, it's been a busy chat window over there. Anything you'd like to jump in and note at this time? Amy, the only thing I'll, I'll add is to the point that you made uh, about percentage of instruction. Uh, we have, in fact, been asked about whether Keeping Pace could put a percentage of instruction uh, definition into blended. And, and Amy, as you mentioned, we've really resisted doing that. And part of the reason that we've resisted doing that is there's is really this uh, philosophical issue and question about do we want blended schools to turn into a category to get regulated in a way that's different than face-to-face -face schools, traditional schools? And to this point, our view on that has been we probably don't want to see a different type of regulation. Uh, we've certainly seen that with online schools. In some ways, it's probably appropriate. It's not at all clear to us that it's appropriate for blended schools. And most importantly, 
when uh, a policy comes in that creates some sort of different set of requirements for a subset of schools, uh, you're, you're going to see that change uh, the activity on the ground. It, it, it's like uh, the, I think it's called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. When, when you start to look at something or study it, you're, you're in fact changing it. Well, when you put in a policy, uh, there's a really good chance that you're changing act activity on the ground. For example, in Maryland, courses that are 80% online uh, require a different level of regulation than courses that are 79% online or less. Uh, so, of course, we tend to uh, see lots of courses that are less than 80% online. That's part of the reason we don't want to put a number around percent of uh, instruction being online uh, to call a school blended because we tend to think that that might drive practice and policy in a way that it's really far too early to do if, if in fact, that would ever be appropriate. Amy, back to you. Great. Thanks, John. I'm going to keep rolling, but definitely keep jumping into the chat window with questions if you have them, and John will field them and jump back in if um, there's a topic that we should address with the entire group. Single district programs. I mentioned that we've seen significant growth in this area in the last two to three years, and in fact, I think it's great to see so many attendees who appear to be from what we would call a single district program. And so typically these programs are only serving students within their district or are primarily st serving students within their district. It depends on a state's laws as to whether or not a district is allowed to serve out of district students. In Colorado, a program can seek authorization either as a single district program or as a multi-district program. Um, and that allows the, uh, allows programs to serve students out of district, it also can change the funding structure. But what we're seeing is a rise in districts that are creating a myriad of options for their students. And so there are some examples up here. I don't have a pretty map because the reality is that we actually think the significant majority of districts out there are doing something now in online and blended learning. And so we're having a hard time putting our arms around this one. Single district programs do not have to report up to a state in most states. And so they don't have to report either supplemental online enrollments or fully online enrollments as long as they're simply serving districts, students within their district with a different teaching and learning modality. But these districts are just a very quick list of examples that are offering a wide range of, op of options to their students. They're offering fully online options, blended courses, supplemental online courses, teacher professional development, and potentially bring your own device or one-to-one -one programs. And what they're realizing is that, and especially in districts like Riverside and actually Albuquerque in New Mexico is another example of a district that is creating a variety of options for students to meet them where they are. And so a lot of dropout recovery programs that are letting students um, maybe only come into school if they are um, not achieving a certain grade point average, for example. But if you are achieving a certain grade point average, you can stay fully online. And so they're creating very flexible options for students and a variety of different options for students. Now we're going to jump to multi-district fully online programs. And now we'll start in with some of the pretty maps. <laughs> multi-district fully online schools are often charter schools, although that is starting to change. And we're starting to see more and more states that allow district virtual schools to serve students statewide. There were 310,000 students enrolled in fully online programs in 30 states last year. So 310,000 students in 30 states. We counted about 295,000 students. But what we know is that there are certainly students enrolled in fully online programs that, again, don't have to report up to the state. So like those single district programs, we know there are students out there getting their entire education online, but that's not necessarily being locked by the state. Um, California is an example of a state that doesn't require schools to indicate if a program is fully online in its reporting, in its state reporting. And so we've pieced our number together through a variety of sources, including the California e-learning census. And if you live in California, 
you are likely aware of the census because Brian Bridges has knocked on your door until you filled it out. And it's the only reason that we've gotten close. We are excited this year to have added a, a second color to this map because we're indicating states that have restrictions in their fully online schools. So the schools, the states that are highlighted in more of a reddish color have some sort of restriction that prevents unlimited growth in the multi-district fully online schools. There are a variety of, of restrictions in place. In Oregon, only 3% of students in any given district can go to school fully online. In Iowa, there's a statewide cap of about 900 students that can go to school entirely online. Arkansas, at the present time, has one school serving 3,000, that is allowed to serve up to 3,000 students this year. That cap has actually increased significantly from, I believe it was 500 last year, and increased up to 3,000 this year, but it's still only one school. Tennessee has a pile of restrictions in place, and in fact, I hope you can understand my shorthand over there a little bit, but initial enrollment is limited. Um, there, at least 75% of the students served by any given program must be in district in an attempt to prevent districts from making money off of out-of-district out of students. No school shall exceed 5,000 students, and restrictions can be lifted or schools can be closed based on school performance. And that law was just put into place in the last few months, but is retroactive for the last couple of years, and so is affecting the virtual schools that have been open in the state for the last couple of years. The restrictions for these schools tend to fall into three different categories, either the number of students, the number of schools, and whether or not schools are allowed to serve out of district students and how many out of districts how, how many out of district students they can serve. And more and more of these restrictions are getting passed each year. And in fact, um, Virginia actually scaled back its fully online school this year. The one school that was operating statewide last year is now primarily serving students in two counties. And so the number of states that offer a multi-district fully online school dropped from 30 to 29 in the last year. Um, and that's the first year that we've seen the total number of states offering this option to students drop. Moving on to state-supported supplemental options, there are two different types of state-supported supplemental options identified in Keeping Pace this year. Historically, we've looked at state virtual schools, which are highlighted Sorry in Sorry to interrupt. I'm yeah. a little slow because I was. No, that's OK. I should there's, have asked you. There's, a, there's a question so from Tom Clark. Uh, I'll give a, an initial answer to this and, and then see if there's anything that you want to add. Uh, Tom Clark says, uh, Keeping Pace says that no new states offered fully online schools this school year. Uh, are they moving towards blended? Uh, so let me give a, an initial answer to that and, and then Amy see what you want to add. Uh, the, the answer is in some ways, yes, uh, we're seeing a move towards blended, but I don't really think that fully online schools and blended schools are or should be seen as substitutes for one another. Um, and, and the reason for that is the fully online schools that we see uh, the, the 310,000 students attending those schools, which, which uh, by the way, as, as Amy alluded to, that tends to be no more than a very small percentage of the population in each state, topping out at a, typically about 3%. That tends to be, uh, in many cases, a population of students and families for whom attending a physical school at any time uh, may not be appropriate for them or in some cases possible for them for medical reasons, travel reasons, or, or other reasons. So those blended schools, I, I don't think uh, we, we would want to suggest are a substitute for them. I would say that um, what we are seeing is, uh, there's a couple of things going on. Uh, one is that as you look at this map, and, and thanks for putting it back up, Amy, the, the states that are, are not allowing fully online schools fall into a few categories. There are some states where there have been some, uh, some real attempts to allow online schools. 
uh, which thus far have just not uh, created the right policy landscape. Uh, a couple of examples. In Maine, there's a, there's a charter school law allowing online schools, but the charter school commission uh, hasn't been able to decide under what circumstances it will authorize online schools. Uh, Virginia actually at one point had some online schools that, and we counted Virginia in the state category, but it, but due to funding issues and in particular differences between local and state funding, uh, have kept the, essentially made it not feasible for a school to operate across the state in Virginia. North Carolina has also, uh, looked at online schools and thus far really not been able to figure out how they want to allow those online schools. In Illinois, there was a push for uh, an online school operating across a number of districts, and there was a subsequent moratorium on, uh, on online schools being allowed. And I think these tend to be states uh, that either there is uh, a, a strong union presence and the, uh, and the union, the, the teachers union has pushed back against allowing these types of schools, or in other cases, there's a, a strong set of uh, school boards associations, uh, superintendents associations, or others that have pushed back against these types of schools. Uh, many of you on this call may be familiar with some of the negative press that online schools, particularly those that are associated with K-12, Inc., uh, have generated, and, and I think that has also uh, resulted in a real slowdown in the states that are allowing these types of schools. Amy, I'll go back to you. Great. Thanks, John. I think we'll shift gears and continue talking about state-supported supplemental options. So we were looking a moment ago at fully online schools, but now we're going to look at um, two different types of programs that are supported or managed by state offices of education or other state entities. Because in general, what we see is that even if there are single district programs in a state that are serving a good number of students or if there are multi-district programs, there's a difference between district programs serving students with supplemental courses and states making options available to every student across the state. And so we're looking at two different types of programs, the state virtual schools that are highlighted in green on this map, and states that have course choice programs in place, highlighted in kind of a yellowish color on that map. And then there are a handful of states that offer both types of programs, which we'll dig into as we look at these different program types. State virtual schools are operating in 25 states as of this school year, but last year we're operating in 27 states and served over 740,000 course enrollments. A course enrollment is defined as one student taking one supplemental online course, one semester long online course. And so Florida Virtual School, which served 410,000 state virtual school enrollments, the number you see up at the top there is actually a combined number of both, the state virtual school and course choice enrollments. But Florida Virtual School served 410,000 course enrollments last year. In other words, more than half of the course enrollments served by all state virtual schools around the country. In general, the state virtual schools in the southeast are very strong. North Carolina served over 90,000 course enrollments, Alabama over 50,000, Georgia 25,000, and Virginia is another one that is fairly large and served over 13,000 students last year. We saw two state virtual schools close at the end of this past school year, so they served students through school year 2012-13. Louisiana is shifting its state resources into a course choice program, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. And Connecticut had um, essentially seen its enrollments go down over the last few years, partially due to funding challenges and closed its state virtual school at the end of this past school year as well. This is the second or third year in a row that we've seen the number of state virtual schools decline. We also saw programs in Kentucky and Tennessee close over the last couple of years. So unlike the multi-district fully online schools, we have seen some of these programs close. But what we're seeing with state virtual schools is that they're 
bifurcating into two different categories. Those that are well supported and well funded, like the schools in the Southeast that I mentioned and some others around the country, like Michigan, and those that aren't well supported and aren't well funded, and so we're, enrollments are stagnating or declining. That's another one that's the case in my home state of Colorado, where we've seen the enrollments stay at about the same, and actually this year I think they went down about 15%. And in Colorado, students have to pay a course enrollment fee in order to access a supplemental online class through the state virtual school. And that enrollment fee is often paid by the district, but not always. And so I think because of that confusion and because of the lack of funding, we're seeing enrollments go down. The other type of state-supported supplemental option we look at in keeping pace is a course choice program. And this is also a new category for us this year. We define a course choice program as one that allows students to choose to take a course from one or more providers where a district cannot deny a student's request to enroll in an out-of-district course, and funding follows the student at the course level. The key to this definition is that a district cannot deny a student's request to enroll in an out-of-district course. This is within reason. In Utah, the students occupation and education plan, I think I've got my um, initials in the right order, a course must abide by a student's general course of education, must abide by that occupation and education plan. And within that, a student is given some freedom to choose a provider. However, there are absolutely states out there, and we'll look at some of them, where the district gets that final say. And what you see on the bottom of the screen there are, is a continuum showing on the left side that where districts have many reasons to deny a student's request to enroll in an online class, or districts have no reasons to deny, or very few reasons to, de to deny a student's request. And so what we've done is we've highlighted the states that we believe have put that power into the student's hands. And those are the states that we have, we have identified as having course choice programs. We have identified seven states as of this year, although this definition is still being refined and we're still um, trying to make sense of this. And so we're curious to get your feedback about this. But you can see the states highlighted in yellowish and then those that also have the stripes on them because there are three states, or excuse me, four states, Michigan, Utah, Georgia, and Florida that have both a state course choice program and a state virtual school. We just created this category this year, and that's partially because so many of these programs are new. Michigan's is just being implemented in school year 13, 14, and actually isn't in place as of this fall, but will be for the spring semester. Louisiana's course choice program just launched this year and is serving about 2,000 students with about 25 providers. We appear to have just lost Amy. Rob, I want to check in and make sure I, it's not this funding me. is uncertain. Um, they pulled together appropriation and grant funding for this year and are trying to figure out what their long-term funding plan is. Oh. Hello. Can you hear me now, Joe? Uh, I, I, was, I was losing you from Hello. Amy, I was losing you there for a moment. And John. I'm going to hear, Rob, can you weigh in on whether uh, you're having any issues with Amy cutting out or whether it's me? Sometimes there's a pause, but she's fine now. Okay. okay. Oh, Thanks, Rob. Interesting. This is my lesson learned about why I should just phone in when I'm one of your presenters. Next time, I'll remember the lesson. Um, well, I'll just keep chatting, but if there's something that you think um, oh, okay. Good to know that you all asked me. Please do jump in and let me know. Um, so the states of course choice programs are really just, most of them are just getting going. The exceptions would be in Florida, which has essentially had course choice for students for about 10 years because Florida Virtual School became a right for students 10 years ago. And then three years ago, the um, well, I'm seeing someone say they don't have audio. Can I get some feedback from folks letting me know if some folks can hear me? Yep, you're you're good okay. right now, Amy. Okay, good, good. Um, otherwise, I might ask John ask you to phone back in. Okay, good. Glad folks are hearing me. So 
Um, we will continue to track and report against course choice enrollment and continue to keep an eye on states that are in that are in this category. Right now we've got these seven states and you can see some of these details. If you'd like to dig into the details about these course choice programs, this table is available in keeping pace with a lot more information. Again, I've got some funky abbreviations in here just to get some information up on the screen. But what you can see is that the age ranges are different in each state. So some serve K through 12. Others serve 9 through 12. Um, and in Michigan, grades 5 through 12 will have access to course choice options. Um, in most states, there is some form of provider authorization. And that could be some simple paperwork, or it could be an expensive course review process. It's different in every single state. Some states also do limit the number of courses that students can take. In Michigan and in Georgia, students can take two courses. I believe it's two in Georgia, maybe might be three. Um, but the other key is um, how funding is set up. And many of these course choice programs are building in some form of completion funding so that providers only receive full funding once a student completes a course. And there are a few states that have implemented this for some of these course choice programs. We do have some states that are in our close but not quite our, as my grandfather says, horseshoes and hand grenades category, where they have passed legislation, and in fact in Oklahoma and Texas, they've passed legislation that very specifically tries to expand student choice or course choice and have that title in the legislation. But we don't think it's quite there. And in general, it's because there are just a few too many restrictions on how students can access those online classes. John, do you have anything else you'd like to add about course choice states? You know, Amy, just, uh, just a comment on the fact that I tend to think that these individual online courses, whether they're being provided uh, through state policy in a course choice program or by a state supporting a state virtual school, I, I tend to feel like they're a really important part of the landscape and uh, perhaps an overlooked part of the landscape. There is, I think, a sense among at least some people that that is a type of online learning, a niche of online learning that now has been around for a number of years. So it's no longer the cutting edge innovative thing. Uh, but I would say it's arguable that it's been the part of online learning that has reached more students in more states with real results that have changed student outcomes. And what I mean by that is in particular the number of students who have been able to take uh, a single course that wouldn't have been available to them otherwise, either because their district of residence uh, simply doesn't offer it, uh, or because the student's own schedule or some other element of the student situation uh, didn't allow them to, to get that course that they wanted. So uh, we, 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 with Keeping Pace, continue to uh, really emphasize the importance uh, of that and uh, push the idea that it should continue to be a very important part of the landscape and the conversation about online and blended learning. Excellent. Thank you, John. I'm going to scoot through one more program type and a couple of policy issues and hand it over to John in just a few minutes to wrap up with our planning for quality section. But this year, for the first time ever, Keeping Pace covered private and independent schools. We actually had our first ever private and independent school sponsor, and we had a, an independent school represented on our program advisory board. And this was very deliberate. The reality is that until very recently, there was a perceived lack of need to include private and independent schools in our research. They historically are known for having high-touch environments, which isn't consistent with the perception of online learning. And so I think the private and independent school sector has been reluctant to move into this area. However, we are seeing more and more signs that 
schools around the country are looking at both blended and online learning. There are a couple of great reports that have come out from the National Association of Independent Schools that have identified existing options for or existing programs that are adopting blended and online learning. And the OASIS conference brought together online education uh, excuse me, private and independent schools working in online education. And what we're seeing is that they're moving into online and blended learning for the same reason that public schools are moving into online and blended learning, as a way to differentiate student instruction and as a way to cut costs. The only statistic we were able to put our arms around this year was that eight states allow private school students to take state-supported supplemental courses. So there are 29 states that offer state-supported supplemental options for students through either a state virtual school or a course choice program, as we just looked at. And eight of those states allow students to take state-supported supplemental courses and do, do not require them to pay. The other 21 states simply don't have a state-supported supplemental option. A lot of these issues that we've talked about, all the different program types and um, some of the, a couple of the policy issues that we'll talk about in just a moment are included in the state snapshot that is at the top of every state profile. So all 50 states and now Washington, D.C. this year have a profile in the last 100 pages of Keeping Pace and every profile begins with one of these state snapshots. So if you're interested in learning more about your state, that's a quick way to get an idea about what is happening. <clears throat> and let's just talk about two policy issues quickly before I wrap up. We often get asked how many states have an online learning requirement. And there are a lot of states that have talked about this, and there have been um, different uh, laws passed that either require or encourage students. The more purple color, and by the way, I should note, our, the, the entire Keeping Pace report is designed by a fabulous design group, Blue Marble, based out of Oregon. This map was not designed by them, and they would probably be embarrassed if they saw it. This is my handy handiwork on the internet. Um, but if you're interested in <clears throat> some of their other design work, they are fabulous folks and wonderful to work with and have done the Keeping Pace design work for many years. But the states highlighted in purple require students to take an online class in order to graduate from high school. So there are four states, Alabama, Florida, Michigan, and Virginia, that require students to take an online class. Arkansas and North Carolina both have policies in progress. So Arkansas is um, piloting an online learning requirement this year with a handful of districts and charter schools and intends to implement the requirement statewide next year. North Carolina has asked North Carolina Virtual Public School to come up with a policy that they will begin to implement next year, but they don't actually anticipate it being required for all students until the 2020 school year which feels so terribly far away that I can't believe that we're talking about it, but <laughs> I suppose it's not that far away. There are also four states that encourage students to take an online class in one form or another. So in some states that could mean that they either let you satisfy the requirement through an online class or through an AP class. In Massachusetts, they note in their math core graduation requirements that online classes are a great way to prepare for college. Um, however, in Massachusetts, there aren't very many ways to take supplemental online classes. There are a couple of programs and a couple of consortium programs that have launched in the last few years and a number of students that take virtual high school classes through the, um, what is the virtual high school collaborative. Um, but there aren't too many options for students at this time. Um, all right, John, would you like to pick up with MOOCs? Uh, well, before I do that, Amy, I'd like, uh, I'm going to point out to you a, a comment or a question that came in from Matt uh, about the states uh, allowing uh, private school students to take, mm -hmm. uh, to take online courses. And he said, 
for example, I know Illinois allows uh, the state virtual school there allows students, uh, but they have to pay. And so, could you clarify uh, the the categories of states that you had in that slide? Yeah, absolutely. I, well, I can add a little bit more clarification. I'm not going to remember these offhand as well as I'd like to. So, Matt, that's an interesting clarification that it's no more than a public student would have to pay. I don't think that we looked at that differentiator. I think we simply looked at whether or not a private school student had to pay for an online class and didn't necessarily compare that to whether or not public school students had to pay for an Illinois virtual school class, for example. And so I think that's another category for us for next year. Well, and, and there's a, a comment coming in from from Corey saying that Utah has no payment for home or private school students, and that is exactly the the main distinction that we're getting at here. Um, there are, in fact, some states as we dug into this that would have in in legislation or policy a line that says something like. Yes, this program is available to homeschool students or private school students as long as they pay. Just there didn't feel like there was a whole lot of value in that because, in fact, there's plenty of providers, uh, private and or public, that are available for parents who are willing to pay. So the main question is, are there, what are the states, what are the situations in which the state has some sort of program, uh, public program, that is funding students who are not otherwise full-time public uh, school students, not students who are not uh, enrolled in a traditional brick-and-mortar school, or for that matter, enrolled in a fully online school, but allowing those students to take a course from a supplemental provider and have public funding uh, pay for that. So that's the, that's the real distinction uh, that we were trying to draw. And it really gets complicated. I, 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 I see there are a number of you who are here from states that have significant homeschool populations uh, and, and some that have significant private school populations. And, and so those of you who are, who, who are from those states uh, probably know this very well. Um, there's this really important distinction where uh, some people will say, well, uh, a homeschool student can go enroll in a, uh, an online public school. And the answer is usually yes. There's a few states that have what they call a prior public requirement. There are very few of those now. There used to be more. And they were saying uh, students to move into a fully online school had to have been in a physical uh, a public school the prior year. Those have mostly gone away. So in most states that have fully online schools, students can go into them even if they have been homeschooled. But they lose that homeschool status. They become a public school student. And so, um, the, so, so there is that situation where um, what we're looking at is the states that the students remain uh, homeschool students but are still able to take a publicly funded online course. Uh, Matt's second comment there about the big difference in Illinois, uh, yes, the public school might be paying the course fee, uh, and a private school could pay that course fee as well. And that's why uh, we're drawing a distinction with some of these other states uh, that, are, uh, that are publicly funding those students who are not in a public school. Yes, and Corey, Corey is adding a comment here that explains the uh, that that explains the situation in Utah that I'm just reading now. In Utah, these are paid for like any other public school student because the student is partaking of courses uh, provided through the public school system, and the AG is being asked to provide an opinion uh, about that. And and uh, it's a really good point, Corey, and thank you for for delving into this. And and, and the 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 good point is that. Uh, these course choice programs and the situations where uh, uh, 
students are being allowed to take these individual online courses even if they are not public school students. They, they are really in the gray area of policy in, in a number of areas. So I'm, I didn't know about the AG being asked for an opinion, but I am not surprised. Uh, we have six minutes left. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, MOOCs and uh, then perhaps uh, planning for quality, something uh, about our uh, work with practitioners. Before I do that, I will mention that with six minutes left, uh, we will be monitoring the chat window very closely. And uh, Amy and Rob Darrow, I, I will ask you uh, for your comments, or I'll ask you to break in uh, and let me know if there's a comment that I should address so we do so before the top of the hour. I do see Tom Clark's question saying he's very interested in our thoughts about the implications of the Florida MOOC study mandate. Tom, I will talk to that. Thank you for the uh, reminder about that. Uh, if you're if you're involved in online and blended learning, there's a very very high probability that you are hearing about MOOCs. Uh, there's a decent probability that at this point you're sick of hearing about MOOCs because they seem to dominate uh, many publications, and and that seem, it, they do seem to be the dominant uh, 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 apparent force in online learning at the post secondary level. We're starting to see a few MOOCs in K-12. Uh, you see the ones listed here. I Learn Ohio has authorized has actually authorized uh, some MOOCs to that can be taken for credit. Michigan Virtual University, Kent State, providing a MOOC for uh, teachers, both in service and pre-service. Uh, Amplify, which some of you may know for the uh, tablets preloaded with content, which has been their main push in K-12 education, has also is also piloting a computer science MOOC. And finally, on this slide, there is legislation in Florida directing the Department of Ed to figure out how to authorize MOOCs uh, for credit in the future, uh, and I would actually say, and also whether they should be authorized. And this brings us re really to what I think is the central question about MOOCs as they replace, a as it pertains to policy, which is, there's no question that MOOCs hold promise as a, a way for a wide variety of online courses to reach a, a large number of students. But the question is, from a policy standpoint, what exactly is a MOOC, and how do you distinguish a MOOC from a, another online course that doesn't have highly active teacher involvement, at least online teacher involvement? And in fact, if you're going to not draw that distinction in one way or another, uh, th then you're really forced to suggest that a MOOC is a MOOC merely because of the number of students that log into it. And in fact, it might look a lot like some of the old computer-based uh, credit recovery courses, for instance, which frankly don't have a history of great success in lots of cases because of the lack of teacher involvement. And so the Florida DOE is right now thinking about not only the issues of how do you issue credit, how do you fund courses, how do you think about quality and accountability standards, but it's really an issue at its heart about what is the policy prescription, what is the policy role in whether teachers should be part of online courses or not. I can tell you from the Evergreen Education Group and the Keeping Pace perspective, in almost all cases, teachers remain at the heart of instruction in online and blended courses. And that means a teacher who is actively communicating with students, not simply a teacher who has pre-recorded a set of lessons. Now certainly for a small subset of uh, highly motivated students and in a situation where you've got that non-consumption situation uh, that the Christian Institute talks about, uh, you do have a role for these types of courses. The concern is whether they become uh, widespread and used in situations where they might not be appropriate, and I think that is exactly what the Florida DOE is studying. 
uh, I, we have had some conversations with them trying to help them figure out some of these issues, and I can tell you they are a challenging set of issues. Uh, I'm not seeing any other comments in the chat window where you're almost out of time. I will mention uh, just one other section of the report, which uh, we have not had a chance to, to go over. It, it really would uh, require a webinar of its own. There's a section called Planning for Quality, which is really meant for practitioners who are starting or growing uh, online and blended programs. Uh, looking at four focus areas, how do you think about content teaching, technology, and operations in a new or, or scaling online or blended program, really with a very strong focus on the question of why are you as an educator, as a school, as a program, as a DOE, thinking about online and blended learning, focusing on those educational goals, uh, and in particular, not simply focusing on the technology. Uh, Rob Darrow, it's the top of the hour. I want to make sure to honor everybody's time. Uh, Amy and I can stay on if there are any other questions that come in. Uh, but Rob, I thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to have us present today. Uh, our email addresses are there on the screen. We had chatted earlier uh, with the website kpk 12 com where the report and all the graphics which are Creative Commons licensed are available. And uh, with that, Amy, thanks so much. And Rob, I'll go back to you. Thanks, John and Amy. It was awesome as always. And of course, it's sure exciting to see how much we've grown over the last 10 years. Grown not only in um, access for students, but grown in knowledge in the areas of blended and online learning. And the Keeping Pace report is certainly one of the bellwether reports that we all use. So it, for those of you who have not yet read it, I would encourage you to download it. And please share it with policymakers and people that you interact with all the time, because it shows a measure of where we've come from and where we're going. So with that, I'll thank everybody for being here, let you know that we have other webinars in INACOL that are coming up next week on blended learning. Just go over to our website, and you can sign up for those as well. And if you want to follow up with John and Amy, we can certainly schedule one in December or January and that sort of thing to talk about some of these other issues. So thanks again, everybody, for being here. Have a great day. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, everyone, for joining us.